What's up, Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another Somnophobia audiobook. We are reading the epilogue today, so this is epilogue number three, so make sure that you have read up on the first and the second before you read this one. I am so sorry that this is late. Um, I've been very busy recently uh, with a lot of other different projects, and it's also been Christmas, and I've had COVID, and it was just New Year's yesterday, so... Yeah, we, it's been a lot, but um, we are going back to the epilogues, and this one's really good, I would say. Um, I, because I've actually read ahead as well, like, I know what happens in epilogue four, um, I'm kind of, like, not as into it as I was before, but I don't know, we're, let's continue, because, like, you you don't know what happens, obviously, so um, you, you're probably going to be into it, but um, uh, who am I to say what you're into? I... <laughs> Let's let's just let's just get into this. I should stop talking. So, the footsteps that had prompted Lucia and her friends and not friends to cower among dusty, caved-in cardboard boxes in a dark, musty storeroom were unlike any footsteps Lucia had heard before. Measured and steady, the steps hit the hallway's linoleum flooring with a bizarre combination of grace and heaviness. The steps were precise taps, barely touching the floor before moving on. At the same time, the steps were weighty. Each tap created a vibration that jutted the storeroom. That reverberation was a disturbing reminder that just a thin wall separated Lucia and the, fro and the others from whatever was stalking down the hallway outside the door that Adrian had just locked. What? Shh, uh, Joel began. Shh, Lucia admonished. Joel glared at Lucia, but he closed his mouth. He pressed his full lips together so they so hard they lost colour. Putting his massive shoulders back and puffing up his chest, Joel made an attempt at swag, but his pale lips, wide eyes and filthy bright purple and yellow t-shirt made it impossible for him to even approximate stylish confidence. He swallowed hard and his pronounced Adam's apple bobbed up and down. Lucia returned her attention to the footsteps. Like Joel and the others, she faced the door. She stiffened as the footsteps' cadence slowed, just a, just a few feet from the storeroom door. Adrian silently widened his stance and pressed his back hard against the door. He braced his hands against the door's scarred red metal. Just as silently, using the light on his feet talents that made on him great that made him a great cheerleader, Nick stepped over to join Adrian. He, too, pressed his hands against the door. His triceps muscles bulged. Clearly, Adrian and Nick were as unwilling to face whatever was outside the storeroom as Lucia was. Glancing at the others, Lucia realised her unease was shared by everyone. Hope, who usually looked perky and pristine in any situation, was dishevelled and smudged. Her big eyes nearly consumed her pale face. She clutched at her friend Kelly, whose brows were bunched over her pr pretty slanted eyes. Not bothering with posturing like his buddy Joel, Wade was backed against the stack of boxes. His broad shoulders were curled inward, and his head was tucked, like he was bracing for a tackle. As a quarterback who'd endured dozens of sacks, he had the posture down. Lucia couldn't see the last of their group, Jace, because he stood behind her. Uh, but she could feel his staccato breaths falling against the kinky curls on the top of her head. She could smell his breath, too. The funnel cake he'd eaten at the carnival had left a sickly sweet residue that had been soured by his fear. What a great line. The carnival. How long ago had they left its bright lights and cheery music? Just a couple hours, Lucia thought. It seemed like days. The footsteps stopped completely, right outside the door. Everyone held their breaths. The already barely there light in the storage room blinked out, blackness engulfed them. Behind Lucia, Jace gasped. Lucia winced at the sound. She stared hard into the darkness, listening for even a hint of movement outside the door. One second. Two seconds. Three seconds. The dim light returned. It was flickering, but it stayed on. Lucia realised she was still counting seconds, and she stopped. The counting somehow made the terror grow and knowing how many seconds were passing wasn't going to stop whatever was about to happen. As soon as Lucia stopped counting, the footsteps started up again. The taps were wrapped in three other nerve-wracking sounds. Each tap came with a hiss, a metallic creak, and a grating rasp. Lucia didn't even want to try to imagine what could make that kind of sound. 
she could tell by the other's taut expressions that they felt the same way. Trying not to count, and failing, Lucia started up again and got to 27 before Adrian removed his hands from the door. Nick followed suit. Everyone remained deathly quiet for another full minute, then Adrian carefully walked away from the door. Lucia noticed that the storage room light was steady again, dim, but steady. Motioning for the others to follow him, Adrian stepped behind two stacks of boxes. The stacks were set apart from at least a dozen similar stacks. Most of the boxes were sealed, but the ones that were open revealed colourful paper cups and plates, pizza pans and boxes, and small toys, probably intended as prizes for the arcade games. All the boxes were sagging, as if deflated by years of moisture, but they felt dry now. In fact, they were almost brittle. As Lucia brushed against the flapping box lid, it crackled like a dried leaf. Adrian led the group through the, the maze of boxes, their feet smudging the dust that covered the black and white checkered floor, their steps occasionally scattering the husks of dead flies and cockroaches. Lucia hoped the cockroaches came after the pizzeria closed. The dust filled the air with a grittiness that smelled vaguely like stale bread, and it was drying out Lucia's nose and mouth. When they reached the back corner of the storage room, Adrian turned and faced them. We need, a f we need to find a way out of here, he whispered. You think? Joel said at full volume. Shh! Everyone hissed at him. Joel held up his oversized, rubbery-looking hands in surrender. He shrugged and tried the swag thing again. It wasn't any more successful than his first attempt. We already looked for a way out, Adrian. Hope protested. She pressed against his side. Adrian put his arm around her. I know, babe, but we weren't careful about it. We were a little... Panicked? Jay suggested. Hit or miss, Adrian said. I think we could be more thorough. We could also try harder to get through the barriers we found, Lucia whispered. If I can't move it, Joel said again at full volume, it can't be moved. Joel got another chorus of shh. Lucia rolled her eyes. We should do a more thorough search for something to pry away the barriers, Adrian said and we should look for ways out we might have missed the first time around. No one protested, but no one jumped into action either. Lucia felt the hair on the back of her neck bristle at the very thought of leaving the storage room. I also think we should split up, Adrian said. We need to find a way out fast. Searching in four teams will speed up the process. Now everyone else spoke up. In whispers, with the exception of the clueless Joel, they all talked at once. Is that a good idea? Lucia asked. She thought it strange that no one was bringing up the elephant in the room. Who, or what, had walked past the storage room door? Me and Wade will buddy up, Joel said. I'm with Joel, Wade said. I'd like to pair with Lucia, Kelly said. I'm with you, Adrian, Jace said. I'm staying with you, hun, Hope said to Adrian. We can team up, Hope, Nick said. Lucia quickly passed the overlapping words. She blinked at Kelly. Why did Kelly want to partner up with Lucia? Adrian, who apparently had decided he was in charge, but he did it in a non-obnoxious way, pointed at the others in turn. Hope, go with Nick. You two are used to working together as a team. Hope's face crumpled for a nanosecond, then she smiled at Nick. She and Nick were the heads of the school's cheerleading squad. They did work well together, she nodded. Jace and I will pair up, Adrian continued. Lucia, are you good with Kelly? Sure. Lucia was actually happy to be paired with Kelly. She'd always wanted to get to know the girl better, and she was sure Kelly could be more useful in a crisis than Jace would be. If Adrian hadn't chosen Jace to partner with, Jace, as Lucia's date, would have wanted to be with Lucia. And Joel's with Wade, Adrian finished. The two overgrown boys nodded. Okay, Adrian said. Let's make a plan. Jace, can I have your tablet and pen? For the next several minutes, the group argued over creating a map of the abandoned restaurant they were trapped in. Even though they'd been together when they'd raced around the place trying to find a way out, they disagreed on which rooms were where. It took a few heated exchanges before Jace finally took the tablet and pen back from Adrian and drew, at almost the speed of light, a detailed map of the dilapidated pizzeria. And of course, because he had an artist's eye, the map was perfect. Thanks Jace, Adrian said when Jace handed him the map. Okay, let's do it this way. Jace and I will take the main dining room, arcade, lobby, and party rooms. But that's where the body parts are, Jace squeaked. I've got your back, Adrian said. 
Jace frowned, but nodded. Hope, Adrian continued, you and Nick take the stage, backstage area, and kitchen area. Hope and Nick gave Adrian a similar frown and nod. Joel and Wade explore the employees' lounge and the other storage room and the furnace room. Ooh, furnace room. <laughs> uh, Lucy and Kelly do a thorough search of the main restrooms, the maintenance room, the room that had all those robotic parts, and the office at the end of the front hall. As he talked, Adrian tapped the appropriate parts of Jace's map. When he was done, no one said anything, and no one moved. Jace cleared his throat. He looked up at Adrian. Um, are we going to ignore what we just heard, or what? Lucia looked at Jace with newfound admiration. Finally, someone was willing to speak about the unspeakable. Adrian rubbed his perfect jaw. His finger rested on the slight indentation on his square chin. After a couple seconds, he said, Sometimes talking about things just makes them worse. Kelly surprisingly spoke up. I agree. I'm sure we all have theories, but if we get into them, they're not going to help us get out of here. They'll probably just get us all worked up and freaked out. Then we'll be too scared to go out there. She pointed toward the storeroom door. Adrian flashed Kelly his best grin. Couldn't have said it better. And the reason I think pairing off is the best thing to do is because a pair can move around more stealthily than a group of eight. It goes without saying that we all need to stay alert for whatever we heard. This, this does feel like a movie, I will admit that. <laughs> it feels very movie-esque. All right. When they'd hesitantly opened the storage room door, Lucia had exhaled in unison with the others when they found the hallway empty. Without discussing it, they all split into their assigned pairs. Even Joel appeared to understand the need for silence as he and Wade crossed the hallway and headed toward the employees' lounge. A few feet back toward the dining room, Hick, uh, Nick and Hope paused by one of the two swinging doors leading into and out of the kitchen. Hope blew a kiss to Adrian and then she and Nick slipped into the kitchen. Hope's face was taut, her brave smile strained. Nick's expression was blank, focused. Adrian, Jace, Kelly and Lucia went further down the hall, heading toward the dining room. Every step they took through the dimly lit hallway raised Lucia's blood pressure a bit higher. Her brain was replaying, in disturbing technicolour, all the body parts they'd found in that room. Every cell in Lucia's body was trying to turn her around and point her in any direction, but the direction they were going, uh, but she overrode their wisdom and pushed on. Once they reached the shadowy, cluttered dining room, however, Lucia was happy to do her group's bidding. They urged her to pick up the pace, and she took off at a jog toward the archway leading to the lobby. Kelly apparently agreed that the dining room wasn't the place to be. She trotted alongside Lucia as they weaved around broken tables and chairs and the inexplicable piles of broken robotic endoskeletons. They were both careful to avoid the areas they knew held decaying body parts. When they eventually reached the red and yellow walled entrance to the restaurant, they paused. Glancing around the lobby to be sure it was empty, thankfully it was, they turned in unison and looked down the main hallway, which ran toward the end of the building opposite the dining room and arcade. Lucia and the others had been so out of their minds with the shock of finding the body parts that when they'd run down this hall toward the glowing red exit sign, Lucia had barely registered her surroundings. Now Lucia was more alert, more aware of what was nearby, so she noted the faded, peeling posters that lined the hall's red walls. Kelly leaned toward Lucia and whispered in Lucia's ear, those were the original animatronic characters, right? Lucia gazed at the posters, which depicted a top hat wearing brown bear, a blue bunny cradling a guitar, a bright yellow chick holding a toothy cupcake poised on a plate, and a pirate fox sporting a black eye patch and a hook in place of one hand. Lucia nodded. Together, she and Kelly took a tentative step down the hall. Both of them looked left and right constantly. They threw in frequent glances over their shoulders too. Lucia was thankful that her partner was as diligently vigilant, that's really difficult to say, as Lucia was. Like all the other areas of the restaurant, the hallway was lit, but the light wasn't bright. Flickering light bulbs created pockets of pale yellow and murky grey along the checkered floored corridor. Lucia concentrated on the dark doorways that were spaced along the hallway. She remembered from their earlier quick search for an exit, and from Jay's map, that the first two doorways led to restrooms. The next one opened into a maintenance supply room. B 
beyond that was the robotic parts and service room. And at the end of the hall, just before the exit that was completely blocked by concrete blocks and heavy metal endoskeletons, a small office sat shrouded in murky half-light. Restrooms first? Kelly asked. Lucia nodded. Together they walked to forward and eased open the soiled yellow door that was marked Ladies. They stepped into a room lined on one side by white sinks stained brown by dirt and dust, and on the other by a row of disconcertingly dark stools with closed red metal doors. Because the restroom was even gloomier than the hallway, Lucia couldn't see under the stool doors. Anything could have been lurking behind them. Lucia exchanged a look with Kelly, who pointed at the first closed stool door. Together they took mincing steps toward it. Yo dude, Joel said, reaching into one of the black metal lockers lining the back wall of the employee's lounge. Check this out. He held up something small and rectangular. It's a pager. How's that for a blast from the past? I think that's how you say it. Yeah, pager, not packer. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what a pager is, I'm pretty sure it's like a, a tape, right? It's like an old tape, um, which could be connected to Henry, wink, wink. Uh, Wade, who had been trying to loosen a vent cover on the other side of the room, lifted his head and scowled at his friend. Could you keep it down? He scolded in a loud whisper. Joel grumbled and flipped closed the locker he'd been rifling through. Or riffling through, sorry. I always say rifling. Um, it's the spelling that catches me out. The metallic slap echoed through the room. Wade cringed and shook his head. Wade and Joel had been friends for two years, since they both got on the varsity football team. Sometimes, though, Wade wasn't so sure friends was the right word to describe their relationship. The truth was, they didn't have a lot in common. Football was pretty much it, but that didn't stop them from hanging out together all the time. Once in a great while, usually because he was feeling sorry for himself because his dad had smacked him around, Wade was willing to admit that he and Joel spent all their time together because neither of them had any other real friends. Most of the time, though, Wade just pretended he chose Joel as his best buddy, and he put up with his friend's frequent stupidity. Wade wasn't in the mood to tolerate it at the moment, though. He wanted out of this place. Do you want to try to make some more noise? Wade flung at Joel. Maybe we can get to get. Uh, maybe we can get whatever was out in the hallway to come and face us off. Off with us. Oh my gosh, sorry. Joel jutted out his chest. Think we can't take him? Wade sighed and returned to working on the grate cover. He was using his Swiss Army multi-tools um, screwdriver to remove one of the cover's screws. You think it's a him? He muttered as he worked. Huh? Joel asked. Wade got the screw out. He just had one more to go before he could push the cover aside and see if the crawl space led anywhere helpful. What are you doing? Joel asked. I want to see where the duct work goes, Wade said. Maybe it leads to an exterior vent. <coughs> Sorry. Sounds like a long shot, Joel said. Wade bristled. Think you're going to find an exit in one of those lockers? He snapped. As soon as he finished talking, he heard a fingernails on a chalkboard like screech. He whirled and glared at Joel. What are you doing now? Wade hissed. Joel, his dark eyes wide, shook his head. I didn't do anything, he whispered. Then he pointed at the wall a few feet from where Wade kneeled. It came from over there, behind the wall. Wade froze. He thought about the sound. Joel was right. It hadn't come from behind Wade. It had come from... Wade scrambled back from the vent cover. He popped to his feet and looked around the shadowy room filled with overturned tables and chairs. The sound came again, a metal-on-metal metal scraping sound. It seemed to reach through the wall and carve a path across the room. You're probably right about the ductwork, Wade whispered, even softer than before. Let's go check out the other storage room. Joel didn't respond. He turned and trotted toward the door. Wade was right behind him. Hope grasped the edge of the heavy velvet stage curtain. Its surface felt fuzzy and disconcertingly crusty against her fingers. The curtain smelled too. The stench was acrid, and it didn't do anything to quell the nausea that had been churning in Hope's belly since they'd found the dismembered bodies in the dining room. Some of the ripped off arms were just a few feet from the stage she and Nick um, stood on now. Hope shuddered and swallowed bile that gurgled up the back of her throat. She nearly squealed when Nick leaned in front of her and, peeled in and peered into the splotchy shadows behind the curtain. See anything? he whispered. 
Hope concentrated on slowing her galloping heart rate as she shook her head. Looks like sound equipment and stage props, she whispered. A heavy thud caused Hope and Nick to whirl around. They huddled together, staring across the dining room toward one of the party rooms. A whispered sorry followed the thud. Both Hope and Nick exhaled uh, pent-up breath. It's just Adrian and Jace, Nick said. Hope nodded. For the hundredth time since she and the others had split up, she wished she was with Adrian. She also tried to ignore the hurt feelings that had eaten her, her since Adrian had chose Jace as his partner. Sure, Jace was Adrian's best friend, but Hope, after all, was Adrian's girlfriend. Didn't girlfriend trump best friend? Hope's rational side understood that Adrian's instinct was to look out for his smaller, weaker friend. He'd been doing it since he was a toddler, but it still rank uh but it still rankled that Adrian's protective instincts placed Jace above Hope. When they got out of this awful place, if they got out of this awful place, Hope and Adrian were going to have a long conversation about their feelings and his priorities. Good relationships required communication. They needed to talk about out uh, their hurts instead of letting them fester. Come on, Nick whispered, interrupting Hope's righteous indignation. There might be an exit behind those wardrobes over there. We didn't look back here very thoroughly when we were running around trying to find a way out earlier. Hope shook off her, pr her petty jealousy and looked in the direction of Nick's pointing finger. Nick was right. Three large costume wardrobes stood shoulder to shoulder toward the rear of the backstage area. It made sense that there might be a door leading to a loading dock or something back here. Nick stepped ahead of Hope and began striding toward the wardrobes. Hope started after him, but then she stopped. A sharp tingle between her shoulder blades spun her around. She knew that sensation. She got it when she felt like she was being watched. Hope scanned the detritus, the detritus littering and the dining room floor. Oh, sorry. Let me, let me restart. Hope scanned the detritus littering the dining room floor. Trying not to look too hard at the scattered body parts, she searched the shadows for movement. When she didn't see anything, she stepped through the curtain opening and dropped the curtain behind her. It was a relief to let go of the stiff fabric. The curtain swished across the stage floor when Hope let it go. The movement sounded like a long, dry-throated sigh. The motion created a breeze, too. The air current disturbed a clutter of dust bunnies that wafted across the dusty wood floor. Hope took a couple steps. She stopped again. The prickling feeling between her shoulder blades was now skimming down her spine and radiating throughout her body. It wasn't directional, she realised. Whatever her body was aware of wasn't necessarily behind her, but it was close by. Nick, Hope whispered. Be careful. Nick turned and winked at Hope. That's the word of the hour, for sure. He was right, and he was being nice. Telling him to be careful was no more, than help no more helpful than telling him to breathe. They'd been nothing but careful since they'd split up from their friends. As they'd searched the kitchens, opening all the cabinets in the hope that one might be connected to a hidden corridor that led to an exit, they'd never gotten more than a couple feet apart. And without agreeing to do so, they'd stepped so lightly that their movement was nearly soundless. Hope shook her head. Sorry, I'm just... Nick backtracked and took Hope's hand. The warmth was familiar and welcome. She squeezed his hand to let him know she was glad he was here. In truth, and in spite of her hurt feelings, Hope was glad to be paired with Nick. Hope and Adrian made a great couple, but they didn't yet have the connection Hope had with Nick. Ooh. She and Nick had been cheerleading together for three years. They never considered being a couple. Their link wasn't romantic. But they got each other. They were in sync. Nick was like the brother Hope didn't have. I get it, Nick said. I'm scared too. Hope met his warm brown eyes and took comfort in his familiar rounded features. She nodded. Okay, let's see what's behind the wardrobes. Together, they stepped toward the tall black painted cabinets. As they did, the wood floor creaked and one of the cabinet doors fell open. Hope sucked in her breath and tightened her grip on Nick's hand. They both froze. Several seconds passed. Nothing inside the wardrobe moved. Nick chuckled and gestured at the floor. The boards are warped, he whispered. The wardrobe doors are probably warped too. Our weight jostled the wardrobe is all. Hope nodded. The pins and needles poking at her nervous system got more insistent. 
She turned in the full circle and searched the nooks and crannies beyond the stage props. She saw nothing that looked threatening. Nick let go of Hope's hand. Wow, he breathed. Look at these. Nick strode toward the open wardrobe and flung the door back all the way. This backstage room was poorly lit. The pale yellow glow from half-dead stage lights high up on the wall ahead of them was spluttering, as if the beams were coming from candles instead of old incandescent bulbs. Even in the uneven, <laughs> even in the uneven illumination, though, the light easily reached into the wardrobe and revealed a cluster of bright animal costumes. Nick reached out and touched a blue bunny ear. He flicked it outside. Whoa, this is a deep wardrobe. He leaned, he leaned in further. I think it might have a back door. Maybe there's a secret passageway or something. Jace resisted the urge to grab onto Adrian's belt loop as he followed his friend through the hulking maze of dirty, battered arcade games. Jace was mere inches from Adrian as he matched Adrian's pace, step for step, along the narrow aisle sorry, between a row of pinball machines and the backside of a phalanx of skee-ball machines. Um, Jace's stride was so in tandem with... Adrian's that their progress created what sounded like just one set of footsteps, a hushed rhythm of cautious footfalls. Jace had been dodging Adrian at this stuck-to-you distance ever since they'd crossed the dining room to start their search in one of the party rooms. He'd basically become an extension of Adrian, moving with him in unison as they prowled past long party tables, shoved aside boxes of party favours, and poked at vent covers in an attempt to find an exit they'd missed before. Unfortunately, neither party room revealed a way out of the building, so now they were trying to find a boarded up window or a crawl space in the arcade area. It was a testament to Adrian's patience that he hadn't told Jace to back off. Jace knew that, but he couldn't help himself. He couldn't remember ever being this frightened, and that was saying a lot. Scared was Jace's middle name. Not really, but it might as well have been. He'd spent most of his life in a state of perpetual anxiety, not that he wasn't entitled to his constant jitters. Um, being raised by a couple of obsessive perfectionists who didn't appreciate having a nerdy artist as a son was enough to make anyone jumpy. On top of that, Jace couldn't seem to look and act like his peers. That made him a target for bullies and regular kids alike, even though his best friend was one of the popular kids. Adrian's friendship protected Jace to an extent, but it didn't make him feel bulletproof. Uh, a muffled clank that sounded like it had come from the stage, or near it, brought Adrian to an abrupt stop. Jace, pl uh, Jace ploughed into Adrian with an audible oof. Adrian turned and put his finger to his lips. Uh, Jace nodded, but his breathing sounded ridiculously loud. He held his breath and listened. Hope knew her body was trying to warn her, but because her body didn't speak in words, she didn't fully understand what it was trying to tell her. Therefore, the warning didn't come in time. Hope didn't realise the extent of the danger until Nick was suddenly seized by something unseen, something that yanked him so far into the wardrobe that he disappeared behind the false fur costumes. Nick! Hope started toward the wardrobe, blood pounding in her, eye, in her ears. She only took two steps before the costumes churned and Nick shot back into view. Nick! Hope re breathed in relief. Nick stumbled away from the wardrobe. His gaze was locked on Hope. She met his eyes, which were bulging and jittery. What? Hope began. Nick emitted the most deranged chuckle Hope had ever heard. He looked down. My arm is gone. His tone was dispassionate, empty of life. Oh my god. <laughs> that was a really good line. Oh my gosh. Hope shifted her gaze from Nick's face to his torso and she immediately wondered how she could have failed to see it right away. Nick's arm was gone. Hope opened her mouth to scream. She never got the sound out. Behind Nick, the costume seethed. Almost faster than Hope could process the movement, metal hands speared through the costumes and encircled Nick's throat. Hope was transfixed, unable to move, even to breathe. The problem was that her brain couldn't compute something that was not that was so not part of the world she knew. In Hope's world, blackened metal skeletons, e enmeshed in tangled black wire, 
protruding from segmented joints and pumping pistons, didn't move with lightning speed. In Hope's experience, stripped down robots with rectangular shaped black skulls didn't leer with protruding glowing white eyes above a gaping hinged mouth filled with huge white teeth. And in Hope's universe, sharp metal fingers didn't twist off a head with a wet snap as if it was a bottle's lid. When Hope saw the torn remains of Nick's neck, she found herself in this new, appalling reality, and it annihilated her. For several seconds, Hope could do nothing but stare into the stark black pupils gleaming in the middle of the robot's swollen white eyes. The eyes were set in metal squares, and separated by a vertical swollen metal nodule that kept that swept up to the top of the robot's skull, creating a narrow dome-like frontal bone. This part of the robot's cranium was filthy, spotted with rust-coloured stains that Hope's mind vaguely processed as dried blood. The robot's intense gaze mesmerised Hope, even as her brain fought to process the creature's existence and the bright red blood that gushed between the articulated fingers at the end of its massive metal arms. In those few seconds, time slowed down so much that Nick's head seemed to tumble over and over endlessly as it headed toward the stage floor. Hope was mesmerised by the sight of Nick's lifeless staring eyes, there and then gone, replaced by a lock of Nick's thick brown hair, slick with his blood. Then the eyes again, and then the stark white of Nick's brainstem jutting past the ragged edges of the skin at his jawline, rotating and falling, Nick's head arced toward the floor. And then it hit the wood, with a sickening, sloppy thunk. And that's when Hope's brain rebooted. This time, it was able to get across her body's message. Run. Just as the robot took a step toward her, Hope screamed, and then she took off. That was written incredibly. That was... That was so well written. I'm sorry if that was loud. Sorry, uh, that was really well written. Um, I must say the um, like the summaries don't do it justice. The leaks don't do it justice. Um, it's not finished yet, but like just that segment was really really well done. Lucia and Kelly were on their way back down the main hall. Although their mission to find a way out of the pizzeria had failed, they both were in better spirits than they'd been when they'd started their search. They were even starting to joke with each other. Maybe you should ditch Hope and hang out with me, Lucia said as they left the office that had teased them with an opening to some large ductwork, but then thwarted them when they managed to get the vent cover off, only to discover that the ductwork was blocked by a chunk of concrete just a few feet from its opening. No one, not even Joel, was going to get past that. I appreciate the way you think a lot more than she does, Lucia continued. Lucia's comment was fuelled by Kelly's admission near the start of their search that she wanted to pair with Lucia because she admired Lucia's individuality and confidence. Kelly laughed. Her laugh was deep and resonant, similar to her voice. Away from the others, Kelly's voice was stronger, more assertive. You might be right, Kelly said. Who knew so much braininess was hidden under all that hair? She playfully flicked a couple of Lucia's curls. Lucia grinned and she didn't resist when Kelly took her arm, as if they'd been besties forever. It was the fear, Lucia knew. They'd been bonding because they were facing a terrifying situation together, and now they were joking because of the relief. They'd scoured their assigned area, missing not even a single square inch, and they were still alive. Again, they hadn't found a way out, but Lucia figured that being in one place in a derelict restaurant filled with decomposing body parts and inhabited by something that had decidedly threatening footsteps was a victory worth appreciating. Maybe, Lucia began, Hope's shrill shriek cut off Lucia's words. The sound rippled through the restaurant in, in un undulating waves. Kelly gripped Lucia's arm so hard that her fingernails dug into Lucia's skin. Lucia and Kelly exchanged a glance and darted down the hall. The sound was coming from the dining room. Kelly and Lucia pounded in that direction. In just seconds, Kelly and Lucia skidded through the archway to the dining room, but they didn't get any further. Run! Hope screamed as she careened toward them. Waving her arms toward the hallway Lucia and Kelly had just come down, Hope yelled, Go! Go! Lucia and Kelly didn't balk. Immediately, 
They turned and retraced their steps. Hope caught up with them and they all ran together. Out of the corner of their eye, Lucius saw Adrian and Jace tear out of the arcade. They galloped toward the archway. What is it? Adrian called out as they came. Hope didn't answer. She just raced, pell-mell, any vestige of her cheerleading grace gone, down the hall. Everyone else followed her. When they were just a few feet down the hall, Joel and Wade surged through a doorway on the left side of the hall. Opposite to the door, uh, opposite the door to the office, they thundered toward the rest of the group. What the hell? Joel bellowed as they came. Hope skidded to a stop outside the men's restroom. She looked around widely. Her face was so white, it was practically translucent. Her eyes were red. Tears streaked her smudged cheeks. When she spotted Adrian, Hope cried out and lunged for him. She threw herself at him, and he wrapped her in his arms. Shh, Adrian soothed. Shh, it's okay. Tell me what happened. Hope said something, but the words were so entangled in hiccuping sobs that they weren't decipherable. Her chest heaved as she pressed against Adrian, as if she could disappear into him. Lucia rotated to be sure nothing was coming down the hall toward them, from either direction. Then she looked at the others. She frowned. Uh, where's Nick? Lucia asked. Hope let out a wail, and her legs went out from under her. Adrian caught her and lifted her, cradling like her like a baby. Hope began babbling again. Everyone leaned in to try to understand her. Lucia's stomach roiled. Tremors cascaded through her body, chilling her. And they brought that with them a miserable, uh, and they brought with them a miserable, knowing that she tried to deny. Oh, I I don't know uh, if I misinterpreted that or something. Uh, anyway, the denial lasted not even half a second. In that time, Hope's words took form. He's dead, Hope burbled. Nick's dead. Everyone exchanged disbelieving looks. They all looked up and down the hallway. What? Joel began. Adrian cut him off. We can't stand out in the open like this. As if to affirm his statement, a long grinding noise resounded through the building. Its origin was impossible to determine. It seemed to come from everywhere at once. Come on, Lucia said. The parts and service room is filled with metal parts. If we hide in there, we can find something to use as a weapon. Adrian, his face hard, nodded once. As a group, they all scurried down the hall toward the open doorway to the parts and service room. It took only seconds for all of them to rush through the door. Wade was the last one through. He immediately slammed the door and locked it. As soon as he did, Hope spoke. I'm okay, she said. I can't stand. Oh, sorry, I can stand. Uh, Adrian gazed at her with concern and he set her down. She gripped his arm, but she remained upright. As soon as they were locked in the room, Lucy regretted her suggestion. Yes, the room was filled with metal that could be used as weapons, but the room was also creepy in the extreme. Its lighting, already spotty, when Lucia and Kelly had explored it earlier, was now flickering as if struggling to stay on. The overhead bulbs' unsteady illumination did little to relieve the room's spook factor. Crammed full of animatronic suits and robotic endoskeletons, the room was set up like a beauty shop for robots. It contained three metal chairs complete with clamps, the chairs could have doubled for torture devices. The chairs were flanked by a couple of workbenches strewn with robotic parts. The suits, rigid and upright, stood around the periphery of the room, making it appear as if a dozen or so Freddy Fazbear characters were surrounding them. Lucia knew that the suits were empty. She and Kelly had checked them all. More, none contained the endoskeletons necessary to animate them. Still, the suits' staring white eyes and open mouths looked way too lifelike. What happened to Nick? Adrian asked. The timber of his words was calm and soft, as if he was pacifying a cornered animal. Hope responded to his soothing demeanour. Licking her lips, she blinked a couple of times. Then she started talking in a flat tone, her words slow and measured, seemingly emotionless. But Lucian knew the emptiness was a facade. Emotions Hope couldn't process yet bubbled below her stiff re recitation, or recitation of the facts. We were looking behind the curtains in the flickering room, Hope said. Nick thought there might be a hidden exit at the back of some wardrobes. I was nervous. Something didn't feel right. But I didn't say anything. Then it came out of the wardrobe. It shot out so fast that it didn't seem real. It took his arm and then it took him by the neck. It grabbed his neck. It ripped his head off. When Hope started speaking, the only thing Lucia could hear was the combined sound of everyone's breathing. Hope had stopped crying. 
Her face was slack. She was staring at one of the endoskeletons. Hope was in shock, obviously. What was it? Jace asked. His voice cracked in the middle of the question. It was big and metal and shiny and black, Hope said. A skeleton, but not a skeleton. Awful eyes, massive teeth, filthy, covered in dried blood. Everyone frowned at her. Kelly reached out and took Hope's hand. Hope, we don't understand. Can you tell us more? Hope shook her head, but she pointed. They all turned and looked at one of the endoskeletons propped against the wall. It was that. Only bigger, Hope said. Lucia stared at the endoskeleton. Then she turned and looked at all the animatronic suits. Her heart lurched up into her throat. Hope kept staring at the endoskeleton. As she did, her breathing quickened and she began to back away from it. She began, uh, sorry, Lucia kept looking at the animatronic suits that surrounded them. She was sure that everyone could hear the throbbing of her heart, which sounded to her ears like a huge bass drum being pounded faster and faster and faster. When Kelly and Lucia had searched this room, the animatronic suits had been empty. But how long had they been on, all been in the hallway? They'd all been cornered, uh, sorry, they'd all been so concerned about Hope, so stupefied by her story, Lucia had no idea how much time had passed. Hope licked her lips as if she could get out the idea that had formed, horribly, uh, in her mind. What if, she began, an endoskeleton could get into costumes like this? She gestured at the animatronic suits. Everyone turned and looked at the dusty characters. Lucia's gaze shifted to each one in turn. She studied a goofy critter dressed in green overalls, a sly-looking orange cat, and a huge grey dog with purple poodle-like scruff on top of its head and around its neck, wrists and ankles. Next to the poodle-like dog, and behind Hope, was another dog, its lolling tongue giving it a friendly look in spite of its spiked collar. As Lucia studied it, the dog moved, and the already struggling light bulbs gave out. Hope squealed as soon as the room went black. One of the guys grunted. Then the lights went back on. They were still weak, unstable, but they were on. In the moment the lights came on, that fraction of a second, the floppy-eared dog stepped forward and its arms came up. It grabbed Hope's biceps just as Lucia cried out, Look out! Lucia's warning was worthless. By the time she got the words out, the thing in the suit had already torn Hope's arms from her body. Hope shrieked so loudly that her scream felt like it was coming from inside Lucia. The sound was an endless keen of indescribable pain and shock. It careened around the room, assaulting them with a desperate finality of what was happening. As the scream coursed around them, the homicidal thing grabbed Hope's torso, flipped her upside down, and wrenched her legs free of her hips. Hope's scream crescendoed into an impossibly high octave and it continued to drill into Lucia's ears as the Freddy thing once again inverted Hope's body before grabbing her head and wrestling, uh, wresting it from her head. <coughs> Sorry. The screaming stopped abruptly. In the sucking silence that followed, Lucia noticed wet warmth on her face and arms. She felt the stickiness that was gluing her shirt to her body. She looked down. She was drenched in Hope's blood, and so was everyone else. Um, for two long seconds, no one moved. They all stared at the carnage that used to be Hope. Adrian's eyes were locked on the vacant gaze of Hope's disembodied head. Then Kelly took Lucia's hand. Come on, she shouted. Lucia stumbled as Kelly tugged her toward the door. There, they fell into Joel, who was scrambling to get to the door unlocked. To get the door unlocked, sorry. Behind them, the, he the heavy tapping footsteps that were now all too familiar started their way. Lucia wanted to cover her ears so she couldn't hear the hiss and the rasp of the paired with the taps. Joel got the door open and he tore through it. The others scrambled after him. They bolted as one down the hall. And that's where it ends. <laughs> um, it, okay, looking back, it is, it is a good epilogue. It's a very good epilogue. Uh, I feel like the second epilogue was kind of, um, you know, introducing these characters. Um, and it was kind of like a filler. But this one definitely picked up the pace, and uh, it's it's really good, yeah. So, thank you all so much for listening, watching. Uh, that's Somnophobia finished. We are going to be going on to Submechanophobia straight away, because it came out like a week ago now. So, um, yeah, we're going to get into that next. So, I'll see you then. Goodbye.